Yeah, so welcome to the second lecture. So today we want to continue talking about a linear regression and then we will do a really explicit example in Python and implement this in gradient descent, but also in the end um, talk a little bit about linear algebra and see how we can solve this linear regression uh, by just using linear algebra without using this um, gradient descent. So recall, oops, no, not this, uh, recall this. So last time I gave an overview over the field of machine learning and there were diff different subfields of machine learning. And so there were re three main uh, subfields. So it was uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforced, reinforced learning or reinforcement learning. And um, last time we started with this uh, supervised learning and supervised learning, there were two subfields, regression and classification. And we started with uh, talking about regression. And next time we will do an example in classification and then later go on to unsupervised learning and also do a reinforced learning. And there I want to maybe do some game AI um, where you teach a, a program to play some games. But first we, we need to do the basics here and which maybe is not so much fun, but um, it's really important to also learn the, the fundamentals. So recall that in, in supervised learning, these two cl classes, classification and uh, regression, um, so there were two main differences between these two types of machine learning. So, and the difference was the output. So in the classification case, <clears throat> the output of our machine or of our program was always something discrete. So there were different classes. And in the regression case, the output of our machine or of our program um, was something continuous, which means it's a number which can take any value between, um, that can take any value. And yeah. So, and the example um, we talked a little bit about last time and which we will solve today in detail um, was this example of um, Tebasaki Eaton. So the, the setup was that we ask some people on the street in Nagoya how long they live in Nagoya and then we ask them how many Tebasaki they have eaten. And in this case, we we have six data points here. So for example, here's a person who just lives um, two weeks in Nagoya and he ate or she ate five Tebasaki, but there's also a person living here uh, for 30 uh, weeks and um, he or she ate um, like 37 Tebasaki. And we see that there seems to be some relationship between the, the number of weeks living in Nagoya and Tebasaki eaten and the, the observation was that this might be some, some linear uh, graph like this. So what we want to, to do, we want to use these data to train a machine to, to create, a, create a, a program which makes a prediction that if we give the, this program the number of weeks we're living in Nagoya, it makes a prediction on um, how many Tebasaka we have eaten. And this is an example of supervised learning and is also an example of regression. So, so we have uh, this, so we introduced these, these words last time that um, asking these people on the street, this gave us some um, training set and the training set was a collection of training example and a training example was given by, uh, in this case, a weeks living in Nagoya. And this we called uh, a feature and then we had uh, the number of Tibasaki eaten, which in this case is called the target or label. And we wanted to find a learning algorithm which, which creates out of these um, training sets a program. And this program we called a hypothesis. So this will be a function. And then in the end, this function will give us um, the number or it gives a prediction of Tibasaki eaten whenever we give this function um, the number of weeks living in Nagoya. Okay. And then to, to write this problem down more precisely, 
or to write down our, our learning algorithm, we, we introduce some notation. So first we introduce this uh, input values or this feature space, which we denoted by X and the output values, the label space by Y. And then in this case, in training example, so a pair of weeks living in Nagoya and number of Tebasaki eaten is then um, an element, a tuple in this product here of this input of this feature space and the label space. And the training set is then just a collection of training examples, which is just given by, by a tuple like this. So in this case here, we have N um, trainings examples. So it's an element in this space here. And what we want to create now um, is a function from the feature space into the label space. And because we, because we call this a hypothesis, we also denote this by H. So H will be a function from X to Y. And a learning algorithm is then a, an algorithm which creates such a function out of, out of a training set. And um, we picked one particular um, um, learning algorithm. So we saw in this um, ex example here that the data looks like that there is a linear relationship between the weeks living in Nagoya and the number of Tebasaki eaten. And therefore we, um, we created a, a certain model. So we, we introduced this notion of linear regression. And in general, this means that we say that our hypothesis has a certain shape. And so this uh, function we are looking for will depend on some theta, which we call parameters or also weights. And these will be just a collection of numbers. And um, then um, the model for our hypothesis is given by this sum here. Because in our example, um, what we will be looking for is we have the case that D equals one. So we just have one feature, the weeks living in Nagoya. And in this case, well, in, so in this case is theta. We are looking for two numbers, theta zero and theta one. And in this case is H theta of X is just um, theta zero plus um, theta one times X. So this is just a linear function like you learned in, in school. And um, this X here, um, so um, because we, we, we want to write it in this way, we will also introduce um, this X zero here. So here we also have an X zero, um, but we use the convention that this X zero is always one um, so the X we plug in into our hypothesis will always have two values, X0 and X1, but X1, uh, X0 will always be one. So this X here is always uh, a vector of size D plus one. So in our example, it's um, size two, uh, but this X0 is always just one. So this is just um, to make the programming later easier and also the, the formulas. So here, this will really just uh, the input is basically always just a number. Um, yeah. Okay, and then the goal is, so the goal is find parameters. Um, so the goal is to find two numbers, theta zero and theta one. And then we introduce the notion of the cost function. So, I mean, we need to decide um, which thetas are good and which thetas are bad. So, oh yeah, so, um, so what we want to have in the end is some um, um, some h of theta x such that this looks like uh, this. And um, to decide which of these um, um, thetas are good and which are bad, so for example, this could be uh, for one theta, but it, uh, for another theta, so this could be some theta prime h of x. Clearly this, this orange theta here um, gives a, best, a better 
um, approximation of these data or a better um, hypothesis than the green line. And the way we want to measure this is we want to, to measure here the differences between the trainings set and our function, which in this case, if I sum up these red lines, then this is smaller than, well, than sunny, summing up uh, these lines here. And to measure this, how good a theta is, um, will be done by this uh, cost function. So it, it, the name is cost function because the higher the cost, um, the worse our thetas are. And um, there are different ways to define a cost function. And the one we choose here is given as follows. So if we have a training set, then our, so we fix a training set. And then our cost function will be a function where we plug in thetas, theta zero and theta one. And then the cost function tells us a number. And if this number is high, then the theta zero and theta one is bad. And if the, the value is low, then the theta zero and theta one are good. And the way we define this is um, we take a, so j, j of theta is given by this sum here. And this sum runs from one to n. So it runs through each um, training example. And for one training example, it um, calculates the value of the hypothesis at the feature and compares this hypothesis at this feature um, with the label of this um, trainings example. And um, so this will be the, the red line. So, and this difference might be positive or negative. And then we square this. So, so these objects will always be positive. And the bigger the difference is, the bigger this, this number here is. And then we sum all of them up. And therefore this um, function here is big if the difference between the, the value of, of the hypothesis at some um, feature differs um, a lot to the corresponding um, label. And what we want to do is we want to minimize this function j of theta. And in general, this j will be a function from rd plus one, um, because um, we also have, so the, the theta starts um, at theta zero, theta one, up to theta d. And as an output, this here will always give a, a real number. And then um, at the end of last lecture, we, um, oh well, so first of all, um, we will talk about two ways to solve this problem. Um, so one way is by using linear algebra and there's an explicit formula which we can write down in the end and say uh, if we have this training data, then theta equals blah 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 is the perfect solution. Um, but um, so this we will do it today at the end, but um, there's also an algorithm to approach the perfect or the best theta um, step by step. And this um, we will also use for other learning algorithms later where this um, perfect solution does not exist. And therefore we want to use this linear regression to, um, to understand the basic principle of this algorithm called a gradient descent. And this we also did last time. So the main idea of gradient descent is, so we want to minimize a function. So if I have some function here let's assume this is um, j, then I want to minimize this function. And to do so, I, I start at some point, at some theta, and I evaluate this function at this theta. So here I have j theta. And then I look at this point at the derivative of this function. And depending on, in this case, if the derivative is positive or negative, I will change um, this theta. So in this case, the derivative of this function here is positive. Therefore, this theta I should make a little bit smaller. So then in the next step, I will get a new theta. Um, and then I can evaluate the value j of the new theta and can look at this place and see, oh, the derivative is still positive. So I should still 
uh, decrease this and get a new theta, j. And then I can go on and go on. So I, at some point, maybe I will be here. And then I see here the derivative is still positive. But then maybe I will um, make it smaller and land here and see the value there and then see the, the, the derivative is negative. And then I go to the right. And in the end, I will land here. And so this is a, the basic idea. But um, in our case, this, so this here would be a function from R to R. But in our case, this um, cost function is a function from R d plus 1 to, um, so in general, this is a function d plus 1 to R. So there one needs to say what, what we mean by derivative and how to decide if a function goes up or down. And, um, and this is then given by the so-called uh, gradient, which some of you learned in calculus and some of you will learn it in calculus. Um, but the gradient um, is actually not so complicated. So here we can see the, the case d equals 1. So here, for example, this j is a fun function from R2 to 1. So it, as an input, um, this gives gets some theta 0 and theta 1 and sends it to, um, to the cost function of, so if this is theta here, and um, so if we start at some point here, so here we have, maybe let's say here, let's say we take a theta zero here and some theta one here. So at this point, I can evaluate this function. So here I have this um, j theta zero theta one. And now I want to decide at this point here, maybe the picture is not so nice here. In this case, where should I go? And so if I stand here on the hill, I need to decide in which direction I go. And in this case, um, for example, here we see that in this direction, it goes up. So we should go in the other direction. And the way to decide um, in which direction we should go is by using the so-called gradient. So the gradient in this case here, which is denoted by this uh, Nabla, so the gradient of j at some point theta is a vector, in this case of size 2, where in the first component we take the derivative with respect to theta 0 of j, and in the second component we take the derivative with respect to the second variable and then plug in theta. So at each point, for example, here, um, it could be that um, the Nabla j of this particular point here. Um, so I hope this is not confusing. So sometimes I write theta and sometimes um, theta 0 and theta 1. So this theta is always a, a the the vector with, with values theta 0 and theta 1. So here, if I evaluate at this blue point here, the, um, the gradient, then maybe in this case, it will be a vector which maybe shows in this direction, because here we see in this picture that the value goes up. So maybe here, it could be uh, that maybe it goes in the direction, uh, I don't know, minus one, minus uh, one. Uh, so here this goes positive. And I know, so maybe in this, so here theta zero goes up. So in this direction, maybe, uh, Maybe we have something like this. Then this would be uh, exactly here the vector which which shows in in this direction roughly. <laughs> anyway, the the statement is that if I have some function like here and I calculate the gradient, then the gradient always shows in the direction um, of the steepest 
steepest ascent, so it shows in the direction where it goes up. And of course, we want to minimize our function, and therefore we uh, take the gradient, we look in this direction, and when, then we turn around and take a step in the opposite direction to make the function smaller. So, yeah, so this is another picture. So we will see in the Python example that in our case, um, that our function will actually look exactly like this. There will be just one minima, and it will be, because it's a quadratic function, our, um, our cost function, um, so we will have a picture like this. But this we will see later in, in the Python example. So, and then the, the general idea of this um, gradient descent is, so this is now the, the algorithm we want to understand. Um, so we start at some point. Um, so we, we will start at, at any point. For example, we start at zero, zero. And then um, we get some value there. And then at this point, we calculate the gradient, which maybe shows in this direction. But we then go in this direction one step and get a new point here. And then again, calculate the gradient and get a new point here. And then in the end, maybe get a final theta, which, um, which gives us here the, the minimal point. So in, in general, <clears throat> if we have D features, then our um, gradient of our function will be a vector of size and d plus one, and um, and the entry is, is are the entries are just given. Oh, there's a typo here. The entries are just given by the partial derivatives, and the 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 algorithm is then we start at some point. We start with any theta, for example, zero 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 or maybe we already have a good guess which the theta could be. And then um, what we do is we say the new theta is the old theta minus, and then um, we take some multiple of the gradient and subtract this. And this alpha here um, is, is called the learning rate. And depending on the size of the alpha, um, we will make a, a big step or a small step. So if we choose the alpha too big, um, then if we go to the example here, if we would choose an alpha which is too big and we start here and we see we should go in this direction and alpha is really big, then maybe we make a really big um, leap and land here. And then here we see we need to go in this direction and then we jump back. And then if alpha is too big, we would just jump around uh, between these two points. And if alpha is too, too small, then it would really take some long time until we, we land here at the minima. Yeah, and so this we do several times because um, one time doing this is just one step and this alpha will say um, the, the size of the step. And this we will do until um, we, we are satisfied. So this could mean several things. So either we could say we do it until um, um, this the value of this j of theta doesn't change anymore, or we just say we always do one thousand steps. And yeah, okay. And and now um, before we go to the implementation, um, we want to calculate this um, gradient in our example, which can be done really um, explicitly. So for this, I will change my paper. Okay. So we want to use this formula here. And to use this, we need to calculate um, this gradient of our function j. So now let's do some calculation. Uh, So recall our um, cost function is given by this and the gradient is defined by this. So what we want to calculate is the partial derivative of our cost function um, with respect to one of these um, variables. Um, so 
we want to calculate the partial derivative del del theta j of this cost function j of theta for all positions. So this j will go from zero to d. So now we need to, to check what this is if we apply this um, to this function here. And this will be just um, standard calculus. So, um, I mean, what is this? So this is, we take the derivative of, so now I just plug in our cost function here. So we take the sum over all trainings examples of h theta xj minus yj m squared. And um, so now, well, what is, what is this here? So now we want to take the derivative of this sum here. But we learn in calculus that um, if I take the derivative of a sum, then I can just take the sum of the derivatives. Um, so I could copy this here and I could change the, the derivative uh, and the sum. So this is uh, no problem. And now, um, um, how do I take the derivative here? So here I have an inner function, um, which depends on this theta. And I have some outer function here. So for this, I need to use the, the, the chain rule. So recall that if I take the derivative, let's say del, del x of g of f of x, then this is just the um, where the derivative of g of f of x times um, the derivative of the inner function. And here in this example, our function outside is just um, x squared. And here we see why um, we have this factor one half in our cost function. Um, so last time I mentioned we include this because later we want to take the derivative to make formulas nicer. But of course, this doesn't make any difference really in our problem because if we want to minimize the cost function, then this factor one half uh, doesn't play any role. But now we see that if we take the derivative here of this function outside, and we get this factor two here, which cancels out with this one half. Um, so if we now apply this, this chain rule here, um, this one half gets canceled out with the two. So I get, so the sum is still there. And um, yeah, and in this part here, um, so this two becomes a one. So I just have this here. So this just stays h of theta x j minus y j times and now we need to take the derivative um, of the of this function here. But um, what is h? So this h here, um, by our model, we said this is um, theta zero plus um, theta one x j one plus bup, 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 theta. Uh, d x j d so if i take the derivative with respect to theta j of this um, function here then everything vanishes except for the term where i have um, theta j so for example if i take the partial derivative with respect to theta one then the de derivative of this here um, everything vanishes except for this here. And the derivative of this with respect to theta one 
is just uh, this xj1 in this case. So in this case here, the only thing which survives if I take the derivative with respect to m theta j, oh, Oh, sorry, I want to use an I here. <laughs> uh, so this I, uh, because here in the sum I use J, sorry. So I want to take the derivative with respect to M theta I, sorry. So the only part which um, survives here is the X, J, M, I. So it's X, j m i sorry so the j here runs over the trainings m examples and this i here um, runs over the the features oh there's a suggestion in the menti chat how about using some different index for sigma uh, which sigma? Oh, you mean this? I don't understand the question in Menti. <laughs> Sorry for... But maybe it was ab about my problem with, with J and I. Anyway, um, so this is the final result um, stating that if I have the cost function j and I take the derivative with respect to theta i, then in the end, um, I get this sum here, which sums over all um, trainings example. And um, it always just multiplies this difference here, which in the picture was the red line, with the, the i-th um, um, feature of this trainings example. But don't worry, we will implement this in a second and make it um, more explicit. So what this means in the d equals one case, so maybe I copy this here. So if d equals one, um, our j goes from r2 to r. And in this case, um, the gradient of j, so this theta is just, just theta zero and theta one. So this will just have two entries. So it will be the derivative with respect to the theta zero and it will be here the second entry with respect to theta one. So in this example, the gradient is just um, a vector of size um, two. And here, according to this formula, um, the first entry of this sum, so we still take the sum over all trainings example, and here calculate our function h theta but maybe in this case, I can also write it down explicitly. Um, so here we just have um, theta zero plus theta one times um, x j minus y j times, and here would be now um, the case um, i equals zero but in this case, this is just one because uh, this is just the convention that the, this one is just one. So here the entry is just given by this sum here. And the second entry is the same sum, but here we have a theta zero, theta one, xj minus yj. And this we multiply, um, by x j.
And here, in this special case, we just have one feature. So more precisely, this would be xj1, but in this case, we just say this is the one, the one number we have x um, of the training set, training's example xj. So most of you are maybe now familiar a little bit um, with Google Colab, and I also shared this um, notebook in the Discord chat. And what I want to do now is everything we just did um, before now in, in Python. So this first code here um, should be familiar to you from the, um, from the test assignment. So we have this, uh, this training set here, so which are just two, two arrays, but I renamed this a little bit now. So tx are our x, x, j. So this is um, uh, x1, this is x2, up to x6. Um, and these are our y's. And then this code here is just um, to, to plot this data. So if we execute this code, um, we get this picture here. Um, which gives exactly the, the graph um, from the lecture. And we want to find um, the line which um, gives the best hypothesis. And this I learned now from one of you. Someone already implemented this also in the test assignment because there's of course already a function which does exactly what we, will, what we want to do. And this is um, um, included in this NP. So this NP here is NumPy, which is a package, a one package uh, for Python to, to do mathematics. And there's of course already a function which makes, which is called polyfit. So this in general makes um, polynomial, um, inter or polynomial fit um, for some data points. And here this entry just says we want to have some uh, linear interpolation of these data points. So this will return two numbers, which are exactly our um, theta zero and theta one. And then what this function here does, it just plots um, this function here, theta zero plus theta one times, and then the corresponding X values. So if I execute this now, um, we will see that what we get here is exactly this line, which we want to find now by ourselves without using this already implemented function here. And we can also check um, in this case, um, for example, we can um, see what these values are. So here we see um, these are actually the values we are looking for. So the theta zero will be 6.4 and the theta one will be 1.05. And you see in the graph, this is exactly if, if there's zero, we are around uh, 6.4 here. Uh, and here, if I go one to the right, I go roughly one up. So this is always, almost has um, derivative one. Okay. But this orange line we now want to, to find by using the gradient descent. So then um, we learned that um, what we want to do is we, we, um, imp we define this function h, which is given by the sum here of the thetas and the x, where the sum runs over all um, features. So the, and the goal is to find these thetas. And we are in the special case when d is one, um, so we really just want to find theta zero and theta one. And we also defined this cost function here, um, which sums over all um, trainings examples. So how would you write down a uh, one possible way to write down this hypothesis? So this hypothesis is a function which depends on, on two things. It depends on the theta and it depends on the input X. So here, this is a way to define a function in Python. So I say I define the function x, and as an input, this function gets um, theta, and I define the function h, and as an input, it becomes uh, theta. It gets an theta, and it gets an x. And what I want to do now, there are probably much nicer ways, um, but um, to, to implement the sum here, one way is to say, uh, I 
write this this sum into this well in this variable red and i return this value in the end and now i go through each um, trainings example here um, so oh sorry um, i mean i go through all features here um, so in general this d here will correspond to the, the length of um, theta and so what I do here for each position, I just add theta i times x i, which is exactly here, the sum uh, on the top. And um, and so this is our training set. This is the same as before. And the number of uh, training examples is just so this l this len here just gives the length, which in this case is our n, and our n in our example is just six because we have six and um, training examples. And then the cost function j, this function here, depends now on this theta. And there we do a similar thing. We just say this is, um, so this here is the same as here. I just wanted to use two different notation to, to just show it. So if I have a variable and I uh, add something to this variable, I could also just say this plus equal. So, so instead of this, I could also just write red equals red plus blah, blah, blah. And here I just take one half times and then I evaluate this h at theta and x. And here um, the input of this h is this vector theta and the vector x. And in our case, when d equals one, both of them have size two. So theta is theta zero and theta one. And this x is x zero and x one. But x0 is always 1. So here as an input, I have x1, which is uh, x0, which is 1, and um, the actual value um, of our feature. So this is tx at the place j, and minus um, the, the label at the place j. And here I just take the square. And um, another way one could write this would be, uh, so I just want to introduce different notations, I could also write it, the square in, in um, Python, you can also just write with two multiplications and the two. So this is also just the square of this expression here. And instead of this plus equal, I could also write this is red plus this. So these two lines do exactly the same. Okay, and um, so now uh, let's run this code here. So what I do here, um, so this T0 and T1 uh, are these um, values which we already got here. So the best possible values. Um, I just want to show what the cost of the post, what is the, the best possible cost. Um, and so here, if I, so in this line here, I just evaluate the cost function at the best possible case. And then I also evaluate the cost function at some other place. Um, so if I run this, then we see that for our good thetas, um, the cost function is 115. And at some other place, um, the cost function is 228. So here the cost function is of course smaller than the cost function at some other choices for theta. So for example, this here, what I draw in the beginning could correspond to this orange line, and maybe this here could correspond to the green line, which is a little bit worse. And what we want to do now is um, minimize this cost function by using this gradient descent. And for this, um, we could first um, and plot the cost function. So there's also a way to plot these uh, three-dimensional things, um, which is also this, this pi plot here. And well, I will not go through in detail through this code here, but this is just maybe not, not the best way, but this is just how you can um, uh, plot these data points. And what we get in our example is this graph here. So we see here, so this is the, the cost or oh, loss function. 
cost function. Sorry. So this is a cost function j, which depends on um, theta zero and theta one. And the blue dot here is the position of our best possible theta zero and theta one. So here this um, theta zero was six point something, and this theta one was one point um, something. So we see here also visually that the cost function at this point has its minima. And for other thetas, um, the cost function gets um, bigger. Uh, so one question is how to find this file. So this file I posted in the um, Discord, in the main chat. So if you want to play around with this file, it's on the Discord. And maybe later after the lecture, I will also put it on the homepage. OK. And maybe someone can put maybe the link in the Zoom chat. Maybe some of the tutors would be nice. And um, yeah, so this is the cost function. And now we want to use this, um, this gradient descent. So we will start at some theta, because we don't know the blue point. This, we cheated to get the blue point. So and we want to start at some random theta, for example, at 0 and 0. So we will start somewhere there. And then we want to go down slowly to, to reach um, this blue point. Yeah, so now you can find the link in the Zoom chat for this document here, and then you can um, play around with this. So, and to do this, we introduce this gradient, which in general was given by, um, oh, here's the same typo. So let me check. Then you can also see. So you can see here in Google Colab, you can also implement, you can write some, some LaTeX. And then uh, you can remove the typo here. And yeah, so this cost, um, we, this gradient was um, given by these partial derivatives. And in the case d equals 1, we saw that um, this gradient is just a vector of size 2. So here, um, now I write it to make it a little bit clearer. So this j depends on this theta, but this theta is just theta 1 and theta 0. So it's a function which depends on these two variables. So I can take the derivative with respect to the one variable and with respect to the other. And then the first entry was just given by this. So here we have a 1, which corresponds to x0. And here we have this x. And now um, we want to implement this gradient here to then use the gradient descent. So, so here is again, I mean, this is redundant, but I put again here the training set. And then the, the gradient, which is now again a function, which depends on some theta. Um, so this is just, so the g0 is the first entry here, and g1 is the second entry. And I want to take the sum over all um, trainings examples. So therefore, I take a sum here where this j runs from 1 to n. And in the first, I just take the hypothesis at the current, um, at this theta here, which we plug into this function. And then we plug in the, the trainings feature. And we subtract the um, trainings label here. And in the second entry, we do the same, except that in this second um, entry here, we also multiply with the trainings feature. So this is exactly the implementation of this formula here in Python. And uh, what I do here in the end, um, which I didn't mention in the lecture, is I also normalize this vector. So usually this gradient shows in the direction of the steepest ascent. But the length of this vector um, also indicates how steep it is. So if it's really steep, then this vector is quite long. And if it's quite flat, this vector is um, quite short. Um, but what we are actually just interested in is the direction. And therefore, what I do here, I normalize this vector. So this vector, no matter how steep this is, I always normalize to have length 1. Um, and you learn in linear algebra to normalize a vector 
you divide by its norm, of course, you would need to check if this is zero or not, but for this case now it's okay. So here um, in this NumPy, there's a linear algebra functions which can calculate the norm of a vector. So this is just the length of this vector. And if I divide by the norm, I, I um, make this vector a unit vector, which means it has length one. Okay, so for example, we can check the gradient at some theta, for example, zero, zero. So let me evaluate this and this. So in this case, um, the theta at zero, zero shows in this direction here. Um, so if you go up, so at zero, zero, at this point there, it shows um, in this direction here, as we can see here, because it, it goes down. Oh, there's also. Uh, so one question, can um, we also just have one entry here? Um, but this would actually mean that we do not have any features. So this would mean that our um, hypothesis is a constant function which maybe is not the interesting case because the number of entries here is always d plus one and d is the number of um, features because this zero entry is um, corresponds to this um, constant term here so if the entry of this um, gradient is just as one entry this means we just have theta zero here which just means that um, that actually the, the, the value of the function we are looking for does not depend on anything. It's just a constant function. And then the question, is the norm always non-zero um, or will there be an error? Error if, if it's zero. Um, so from the mathematical point of view, um, of course this gradient can be zero and the gradient is exactly zero um, at the minima of the function. Um, but since, um, well, it's a good point. So actually one would need to take care a little bit of this case here, but actually there's not a real zero inside uh, Python. Um, so it can be that this um, norm can be really, really small, but it will not actually be zero. Um, so, um, but of course, Theoretically, it could happen that there's zero, zero and then we would divide by zero and we would get some, um, some error. Um, so maybe here one needs to be careful a little bit, but usually um, for, for, usual, for real life data, um, this would actually not become zero. It would just become a really, really small uh, number. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Okay, so at this case here, we, we get this gradient. And now we want to um, implement this um, gradient descent. And we saw that um, one step in this gradient descent is we start with a theta and then subtract because we want to go in the other direction of the gradient. So we subtract a multiple of the gradient at this theta and this will give us a new theta. And here I just um, wrote out the formula for the gradient, which we calculated uh, here. But this line you can also ignore. So how can we implement this now? So, um, well, we start with some theta. In this case, I choose a zero, zero. And um, so this is now just, I want to take, uh, keep track of the points where we walk around. So this has actually nothing to do with the actual algorithm. Um, but I want to plot in a second also the, the gradient descent so we can see how we walked. And here's the learning rate. So in this case, um, I set it to uh, 0 0.1 and we will change it and then see the difference what happens if we change this alpha. And I start with uh, two well, I can also start with 100 steps. So how often um, take, do I take a step? 
And now um, I just do a for loop here. So this just means um, I do this here for 100 times. And um, so the main part is, is this here. So I say the, the new theta, I overwrite this variable and say I, I take the old theta minus, so all of these objects are arrays. So maybe here I could, well actually in this case it's the same, but maybe it would be better to do it like this. So all of these are, um, so this theta is an array of um, size two and also this gradient function, which we defined here, the gradient function takes um, a vector of size two and it returns a vector of size two, namely our gradient here. <clears throat> And here, so therefore, this is really an equation of, of vectors of size two. Or question. In some rare cases, you can actually refer to this. Ah, yeah. So the comment here is that uh, actually it can happen that I get a real zero and then I get an error. Um, um, so, for example, if I divide by zero, well, in this case, I get this. And maybe um, here, if the so let me uh, ah, yeah. anyway. Yeah, so thank you for the comment. So maybe in practice one should take care of this, but now it's just for showing purposes, but uh, maybe for real life data, this will, will not make any problems. And maybe one can check here if if one is at a point where the gradient is already um, has is really small, and this is all. This usually means that we are already at the point where we want to go, um, because the place here where the gradient has norm zero is exactly at the minima. At all other points, um, the gradient actually has some length, because at other points it goes up or down. Um, so maybe a, a good check here. And this will be part of the first assignment for you to, to make a nicer implementation of this whole thing, would be maybe to check if the gradient has a really small norm, and in this case, um, you're actually at a local minima. So yeah, thank you for the comment. Okay, but now, um, so here we have implemented this step. And what I do here is just, I take, uh, I write down the points where we, where we walk. So I can plot them, but this has nothing to do with the algorithm. And then um, here, after doing this gradient descent, the, um, the values of this theta will give us our result. And then we can com compare it with our um, best theta, which we, we got from the implemented function. So if I run this now, we see that after 100 steps, um, we actually don't really have a nice result. And so after just 100 steps, um, our gradient descent gives us the value 0 0.8 for the first entry and 1.3 um, for the second entry. But we know the, the best value is actually this one here. So let's see what happens if we, for example, uh, increase the number of steps and let this run again. Then we see that it's um, already a little bit or much better. So the first entry is now 6 point something and the second entry is 1.14, which is quite close already to where we want to go. But now let's um, see how this looks like in our explicit example. Um, so there again, um, this function here is just now to, to visualize everything. And here you will see I use the data I, I used here. So in each step I write down the theta zero and theta one. And then here, what I do in this function, I just plot the cost function for these points. So if we let this run here, um, we get this picture here. So I draw, <laughs> I don't know why I wrote cost function. I want to write cost function. So we see um, in our example, we started at zero, zero. So we, we started here at this point on the, on the cost function, and then we took one step in this direction because here it goes down, 
goes down, down, down. And then we, we walked around this path here and then we almost um, reached the blue point here. So this is now the, the movement of our theta. So in the end, the theta was one point. So theta one was one point something and theta zero was six point something. So now we can check um, what happens if we again decrease the number of steps. So for example, if we just take 100 steps and plot this again, um, then we see here, we go here down and then walk around. And after 100 steps, um, we are just here. And maybe now let's increase the, the learning rate. So the learning rate tells us um, how far we walk in each step. So if we take this one and we plot this again, we see we start here, we take a big step there, and we take a big step there, big step there, big step there, and we walk around here. So we see in this case, maybe the number of steps is not so nice. And we also see in this case, maybe gradient descent is not really nice because here it's already uh, quite flat. So the, so the downhill here is not really, it's not really steep. So that's why in each step, we just walk a little bit in this direction. Um, so that's why um, in this case, this gradient descent, uh, we really need um, a lot of steps until we, so now let's take a lot of steps and still um, um, big steps. Oh, this we also need to draw again. Then we see that, uh, that we actually, what I mentioned earlier, if the learning rate is too big, we, we actually do not come close to this because we always jump around um, because we take these big steps. Um, so one question is, if you didn't normalize the gradient, how the result changes? Um, so the result, if we don't normalize, so here we see that um, the step size is always exactly the alpha, but if we wouldn't normalize, then um, in this case, it's quite steep. So the, the length of the gradient um, would be quite big. So in this case, we would actually make a really big um, step. And then here at this point, um, the gradient is, is smaller. So we would do smaller steps. So if we wouldn't normalize, then the steps wouldn't have the, the same size. Um, and in this case, I think it actually looks terrible because in this case, these gradients are really, really big. So let me remove this and see what happens. Uh, yeah, but I think already 0 0.1 is, uh, so let me just do 100 steps. Uh, Um, so in this case, actually, the numbers are too large. Uh, so this has to do with the fact that these gradients are really, really large in this case here. Uh, mm, yeah, so maybe in, in, in your assignment, you can check um, how, so if I don't normalize this, um, for example, here, where in this case, it's not so terrible. Um, but well, at the first step, it's not terrible because this just says I should go uh, in this direction. But now if I go like this in this direction, let's say with learning rate one, and then evaluate um, the, the gradient, then I get this. And then I would walk again by, by big steps like this. And then, so you see that in this case, the gradient are quite large and then Already in the first step, I jump out of this function where the value gets even larger and steeper, and then the gradient gets, is even larger. And then maybe after 10 steps, um, I get an overflow. So um, yeah, so that's why maybe we, we keep the normalized version here. Yeah, thank you for this question. Oh yeah, so, okay.
Yes. Yeah, so one comment, I think not normalized gradient with small learning rate is also usable. Yeah. So we could really make maybe this, um, this learning rate here really, really small so that in the first step, we don't really jump out into the jungle. So, uh, and then it should maybe also work because then it keeps around the, the place where the values are not so big. Yeah, so maybe if you, you open this notebook, you can play around and see um, if you remove the normalization here, um, maybe choose a really small alpha, then it should also lead um, to a good result. Okay. Yes, so this is um, the gradient descent. And one idea of the homework assignment is that you implement this um, not just for one feature, uh, but also for more features. And then um, you will also learn how to use actual real data, which is more interesting than this Tebasaki example. Um, so there are a lot of um, free data sets out there, which you can use um, to, to learn machine learning. And maybe for example, one standard one is this um, house prediction one, um, where as features you have um, the size of an apartment um, maybe the walking distance to the subway station and uh, uh, in the area and so on. And so there are a lot of features which influence the price um, of an apartment. And then you can use this real data and implement this um, linear regression using uh, gradient descent um, to make some prediction um, and then compare these prediction with maybe other data points in these uh, data sets. Okay, so this was um, gradient descent. Um, maybe we will do more examples like this. Um, so what I want to do now is um, talk about, well, we don't have so much time left, but um, as I mentioned at the beginning that there is a direct way to use linear algebra to solve um, this, um, this linear regression. Okay, so, um, so now, uh, Let's recall some linear algebra. And I know some of you uh, did this together with me. And maybe some of you did it with, with uh, Eric Dapeu. And maybe some of you did it in their free time. So, um, so in our case, um, what we wanted to, to, to do is actually wanted to solve a linear system. So assume that we have the situation that our training set and um, that all these points Maybe they, if I have here an x1, x2, x3. So it could be that they all lie on one line. So this is our h. And here are the corresponding y1, y2, y3. And in our example, um, this h is theta zero plus theta one times x. So if they would all lie on a line, these training examples, then um, these thetas would be a solution um, to this equation here. Because um, I mean, if I multiply this out, um, so this you learn at the beginning of linear algebra. For example, the first entry here is exactly um, theta one times uh, x one dot, 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 and up to theta zero plus theta one x n. And so these are exactly h theta x one up to h theta x n. So if, if they lie all on a line, then um, we have this equation here. So in other words, if we call this A and this theta and this Y, then we, we have this equation or this linear system and that the matrix times this vector equals Y. But of course, uh, in applications, like in our Tibasaki example, this is not the case. So they do not lie on a line. So, um, so the statement is, um, 
um, of course, usually it is, this is not the case. Um, so like we had before, we have points like this and they do not lie on a line. Uh, and therefore this equation here um, does not have any solutions uh, because if this has a solution, then there would be a line um, because with just two parameters, this H is just one line. Um, so usually um, we cannot solve uh, we cannot solve this equation usually. But what we want to, want to find is actually, well, we cannot um, find a solution to this equation, but maybe there's a, a, a best possible choice um, for these thetas. And by be best, best possible, we mean that we want to minimize um, this um, a theta minus y. So if, if this has a solution, then this would be just zero. But instead of trying to make it zero, we just try to make it small. And in this case here, this, um, this notation here, this, uh, if I have a vector with entries v1 up to vn, then this norm is just the Euclidean norm, which is given by the, the square root of the sum of the squares of this vector, of the entries of this vector. And in the case when n equals two, so if I have a vector of size two here, v, then the, the norm of this vector is just the length of this here. So this is the norm of v. And also in, in R3, the norm is just the length of this vector. So what we want to do, um, this here is a vector of size n. And we want to minimize the norm of this uh, vector because then um, this corresponding theta is then the, somehow the, the best solution um, to this unsolvable uh, linear equation. But I already see that the remaining time is not enough to do it in detail. Um, so maybe I just give the theorem for free and then we will do this a little bit also again next time. And um, the main theorem is that to minimize, to minimize this expression here. Um, so the best possible choice of this theta is given by those thetas um, which satisfy um, this equation here, where this AT um, is the transpose of A. So if this here is A, then the transpose of A Transpose just means we change rows and columns. So in this case, the first column of A, which is just these ones, um, so these correspond actually to this x0, the first column just becomes the first row. So here this A is a, a n by two matrix, and the transpose will be a two by n matrix. And here the second column becomes the second row. So here it's x1, x2, and so on. And this matrix here, the transpose of A, this matrix times this matrix, and um, this is a two by two matrix, um, because if I multiply this matrix with this matrix, so if I multiply a two by n matrix with a n by two matrix, then the result is a two by two matrix. So this guy here is a two by two matrix. So I have some two by two matrix with some entries and I want to find a theta such that theta zero, theta one equals. And here I multiply this vector Y with the transpose of A, this one here. So if I multiply this vector with this matrix, this is also a vector of size two so this will be some vector of size two. So we see that here in this case, I really have a, I just have two equations I need to solve. And usually there's always a solution. And by usually I mean that, um, 
or maybe some of you remember the kernel of a matrix, but you now you don't really need to care because this is usually satisfied. Um, this just means that the rank of this matrix here um, is two. Um, and usually this will be the case because uh, I just have two columns and a lot of rows. Um, so this just means that these two vectors are linearly independent. Oh, there's just one question. If we have unlimited time, is the lowest learning rate always the best? Uh, well, in this case, yes, because uh, you, you then get the most precise result in the end. Uh, but in real life, you don't have unlimited time. Uh, so, <laughs> but yes, the answer is yes to your question. But here again, um, so the statement here is that if this if we can find a solution to this linear system, then the solution of this linear system will actually give the best possible choice um, for these thetas, meaning that this minimalize this thing here. And this always has a solution, meaning that this matrix here, this two by two matrix um, is always invertible if, if these two columns are linearly uh, independent which you, in fancy terms, you can say that the kernel of this matrix is trivial. But ignore this, because this is usually satisfied. And the statement is that in the end, you can get an explicit formula for the theta by solving this linear equation, meaning you can multiply with the inverse. Um, so you can multiply with the inverse of this matrix with this vector here. And time is running. so. Maybe at the beginning of next time, um, but also here I, I sketched a little bit um, how the proof of this works, but this I will do next time. But I want to, to show this in Python um, so you can believe me that this theorem actually works. So this formula here gives one explicit formula for the thetas we are looking for. So here, um, using linear algebra to find our thetas, so this formula here is now the formula which we didn't prove yet, um, but which we now take for granted for now. Oh, and here's also one example I wanted to do in the lecture, but um, let me skip directly to our Tebasaki example. So in our Tebasaki example, our matrix A, um, where the first column is always one, and the second column contains our features, which were seven, uh, two, seven, 13, and so on. So these are the weeks living in Nagoya and our um, Y vector contains our labels. So these are the number of Tebasaki. And then according to um, this formula, where am I? Ah, to this formula here. Um, so we want to multiply this matrix here. A transpose A takes the inverse, multiply with A transpose and times Y. So this is just one formula here, we take A transpose, so the product of a matrix with a matrix in uh, NumPy is called the function dot. So this is a transpose and the, the uh, matrix has a function called dot. So this is A transpose times A. Then I can take the inverse of this, this gives the matrix, and then I can multiply it with the transpose of A. And this I can multiply with the vector y. And then if we do this, well, you already saw the result, but here we see that actually this one line formula gives um, our um, theta zero and theta one. And these are the, the ones we saw uh, before. Yeah, I think we had uh, theta zero and theta one. Yeah, so these are actually exactly the same. Maybe here's just some rounding up. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So here the seven rounds this up to a two. Okay. Um, so maybe this is enough for today. Um, so I will stop um, recording and then you can still ask some questions.